Do you guys not have phones? Yeah, you guys that, all have phones. Phone. Right? Gaming is the most profitable form of entertainment in the entire world. And of course, because of that, there are a lot of people that argue on the internet over what are oftentimes children's games. And today we'll be talking about some of the biggest examples of this from the modern internet age. Launching in 2009, the website Kickstarter rapidly became the premier location for anyone with an idea for a project to get the funding which could turn their dream into a reality. Thousands flocked to the site, hoping to become millionaires from their projects. Of course, with anyone being allowed to use the service, it goes without saying that many of these campaigns ultimately ended up falling apart or under-delivering on their ambitious promises. While the vast majority of Kickstarter's users tend to be people with very little experience in the world of business, there have been some who have already proven themselves trustworthy with years of work in their respective fields. And that only makes it more notable when they crack and burn so publicly. Tim Schafer got his start to making games for LucasArts before founding his own studio, Double Fine Productions, in 2000. With the release of cult hits like Psychonauts, Schafer and Double Fine carved out a niche for themselves in the world of gaming and gained a highly respectable reputation. In February of 2012, the studio announced that their next game, tentatively titled Double Fine Adventure, would be entirely funded by fans on Kickstarter. They initially asked for $400,000, only three quarters of which would be for actual development of the game. The remaining 100 k would go towards a behind-the-scenes documentary showing the creation of Double Fine Adventure. The game itself wasn't meant to be anything too big. It was pitched as a simple point-and-click adventure in the vein of Schaefer's earlier work, and development would take place over the course of just a few months. The goal of $400,000 was reached almost immediately upon the Kickstarter campaign's launch. In a mere 24 hours, Double Fine had received over $1 million in donations from eager fans, who wanted to experience the studio's latest project. When the campaign eventually ended, it had earned over $3 million and was hailed as the most successful Kickstarter project at the time. Tim Schafer decided to celebrate this momentous achievement by posting a series of images jokingly depicting what they would be doing with all this money. These included blowing his nose with it, eating it, smoking it, and using it as toilet paper. With the money raised, funders sat back and waited for the game. However, perhaps they should have been skeptical from the beginning. The thing that very few people seemed to be pointing out at the time was that the Kickstarter video did not actually say what the game would be. There was no concept art, nor was there any hint about what the story might entail. The only thing that was known about Double Fine Adventure was the genre. This was because no work had been done on development prior to the launch of the campaign. It wasn't until after the money had been raised that Schaefer began conceptualizing the plot. As work continued, Double Fine's ambitions grew immensely thanks to the huge budget they now had at their disposal. They began hiring A-list talent to voice act, including the likes of Jack Black and Elijah Wood. On top of that, a behind-the-scenes video revealed that Schaefer had hired fellow indie game developer Phil Fish to DJ at a party in the Double Fine office. Eventually, it became clear that the game they were creating had ballooned far past the original idea, and their plans would have to change. In 2013, the team looked over their progress and realized that Double Fine Adventure, now renamed Broken Age, would not be fully completed for another two years. On top of that, they had exhausted almost all of their $3 million budget. Their options now were very limited. Turning to a publisher for help was out of the question, as Schaefer felt that it went against the spirit of the project. They also couldn't ask their backers on Kickstarter for more money. Their solution was to split Broken Age into two parts, with the first installment releasing on Steam Early Access in January of 2014. While this decision caused quite a stir, with some accusing Double Fine of ripping off their supporters since they only originally wanted $400,000, Broken Age Act 1 ended up being a success. It received favorable review scores from both critics and gamers, and earned enough money to fund the completion of Act 2. The public finally got access to the full game later in 2015, 
and once again responded to it positively. Despite the mismanagement and turmoil behind the scenes, Tim Schafer was able to create a product of good enough quality that they escaped with their reputation relatively unscathed. But as we'll find out later today, the same can't be said for everyone who has tried to go down the crowdfunding route. SimCity is a franchise that has been around since the late 80s and is widely hailed for popularizing the simulation genre. The premise of the game is simple. Players must build and maintain their own cities from the ground up. Gamers fell in love with it, putting both the series and its developer, Maxis, on the map. Around 2013, the team began development on a new SimCity title. The people at Maxis wanted this installment in the series to be far more ambitious than anything that had come before with the cities that players created feeling lived in and alive. By this point, the studio had been purchased by the infamous publisher Electronic Arts, who had just one request, the game must feature online multiplayer. Maxis had no objections to this, and were actually excited by the concept of players from all over the world connecting with other people's cities. However, ideas that sound good in theory do not always turn out well in practice. When the game launched, it quickly became apparent that EA's servers lacked the processing power to accommodate all the people trying to log on at the same time. Hundreds of players across the globe reported frequent instances of lag, long load times, and being booted from the server. This was such a problem because the game required being connected to the internet at all times to play. Maxis frantically worked to fix the problems, beefing up the servers so that they could handle the sheer volume of gamers trying to access them. Many wondered why they simply didn't shut off the multiplayer function to allow people to play offline, but the studio stuck to their guns, insisting that being online was necessary to the experience. However, many speculated that the real reason SimCity was always online was so that it would be more difficult to pirate, and just a year later they released an update that allowed people to access the game offline, so clearly it was not an impossibility. Maxis was able to fix some of the technical problems, but at that point it was too late. SimCity's player base was dwindling fast and the game's reputation had been thoroughly dragged through the mud. Maxis was shut down by EA in 2015, and the SimCity franchise has remained dormant ever since. Keiji Inafune began his career at the video game studio Capcom in the 1980s, lending his talents to such landmark projects as Street Fighter, and more notably for this story, Mega Man, as he created the original artwork for the character. As time went on, Inafune became more and more involved in the development of the series, producing many Mega Man titles throughout the late 1980s. By that point, his name was synonymous with the franchise, becoming well known to gamers the world over. By the end of the 2000s though, Capcom had lost interest in creating more installments for the Mega Man series. Inafune still held a prominent position at the company, but clearly still had a desire to continue making the type of games he had cut his teeth on. So, in 2010, mere months after being promoted to Capcom's global head of production, the prolific developer resigned in order to create his own video game studio named Comset. The team worked on small projects for its first few years, mainly assisting other developers, but eventually their ambitions began to grow. It was time to create the Mega Man game that Capcom refused to make. Inafune wanted this game to be for the fans, and decided that the best way to do that would be to have them help fund it via Kickstarter. Mighty No. 9 was unveiled to the world on August 31st, 2013, and fans were thrilled at the promise of a return to the 2D platform shooter gameplay they loved so much. The goal of $900,000 was reached in just a matter of days, and by the end of the campaign, just over a month later, Comcept had raised over $3.8 million. The hype was astronomical amongst gamers, and Inafune seemed very aware of this. He spoke often about his desire to expand the Mighty Number no. 9 brand, and was even in talks with Contradiction Films to make a live action movie about the character. Comcept had also partnered with Japanese studio Digital Frontier to develop an animated series, and a brief teaser for it was released in July of 2014. The developer also expressed a desire to create more Mighty No. 9 content including comics and a live action TV series. But, it's important to keep in mind that, at this point, the only gameplay footage that had been released publicly was a 3 minute test with unfinished graphics. 
Also in 2014, Comcept announced further crowdfunding would be required in order to add bonus content to Mighty No. 9, including English voice acting. By this time, fans were becoming skeptical about what was going on behind the scenes, wondering where their $3 million had gone. The final straw came later in 2015, when Comcept launched yet another Kickstarter campaign for a new game in the Mighty No. 9 universe, titled Red Ash, The Indeligible Legend. Backers of the original project were enraged by this, wanting to know why Inafune was asking for more money when they still hadn't received the game they had been promised years prior. As if this weren't bad enough, Mighty No. 9 backers were becoming frustrated with more than just the development time. Accusations were being spread that Dina Karam, Concept's community manager, had been banning people from the forums who didn't agree with her personal political views. Specifically, it was alleged that she was blacklisting anyone she suspected to be supporting the Gamergate movement. In addition, leaked chat logs revealed that Karam was using her influence behind the scenes in order to inject alleged SJW politics into the game such as changing the races and genders of various characters. Eventually, Karam was let go, but her time in office still left a bad taste in the mouths of many fans. By this point, public perception had turned on Comcept and Inafune. Mighty No. 9 had encountered multiple delays, and the team was running out of excuses. When the release date was pushed back to 2015, the official reason given was that they needed time to develop the multiplayer feature. Fans pushed back, saying that this was something that could have easily been added after release, but Comcept stood their ground and insisted that it needed to be included in the game at launch. Another delay in early 2016 was blamed on a few bugs that still needed to be ironed out, leading some more optimistic fans to think that the game was almost done. However, those hopes were dashed when a new trailer was released a few months later. Not only did many viewers accuse the voiceover narration of being obnoxious. You kill an enemy and you can absorb their power-ups. Stuff that'll make you faster and stronger and make the bad guys cry like an anime fan on prom night. But countless people expressed their disappointment with the graphics. Mighty No. 9 had been in development for years and was set to release in just one month, but the game still looked unfinished. A running meme in the community was to compare the explosion effects showcased in the trailer to a cheese pizza. Even Sonic the Hedgehog, a franchise infamous for publishing buggy and unpolished games, mocked Mighty No. 9 for this on Twitter. At the very least though, the game was now finally being distributed. On June 21st, 2016, the long-awaited project was finally given to the public via digital distribution methods. Backers would still have to wait a little longer to get a physical copy. Gamers playing it at launch soon noticed a plethora of glitches and painfully long loading times combined with the unfinished graphics showcased in the trailer. In fact, a few Wii U players reported their consoles being completely bricked while playing a Mighty No. 9. This particular bug was quickly fixed in an update, but that didn't change the terrible review scores that the Kickstarter-funded project was receiving. Once again, even Sonic the Hedgehog joined in to mock Comcept for their disastrous launch. Things didn't get much better when the physical copies were shipped out either, as backers quickly discovered that the manual included with the game was too big to fit in the box. Today, Mighty No. 9 is remembered as one of the biggest failures in Kickstarter history. Even after multiple years of delays, the game was still released buggy and unpolished, and the multimedia franchise promised by Inafune never came to fruition. At the very least, it proved that there was still public interest in a classic Mega Man game, something that Capcom clearly took note of. In 2018, the studio released Mega Man 11, an official continuation of the series with a much better response from critics and fans. Hello Games started off as a tiny indie studio with big aspirations. After proving their skills with a string of moderate successes, they decided to begin work on a game that would hopefully be their magnum opus, a space exploration simulator that would procedurally generate new planets to traverse, theoretically creating a limitless amount of content. The team quickly put together a trailer for their idea, and No Man's Sky was unveiled to the world at the 2013 VGX Awards. The hype for the game was instantaneous. 
people were enthralled by what Hello Games was promising, and the fact that it was being developed by a studio with less than a dozen employees made it all the more impressive. No Man's Sky soon received funding assistance from Sony for marketing and publishing, and became one of the first indie games shown off on the main stage of E3 2014. One of the founders of Hello Games, Sean Murray, soon became the face of the project as he engaged in multiple interviews during No Man's Sky's development. Every time he spoke about the game publicly, hype grew exponentially as new features were announced. Murray spoke about the incredible worlds that would be explored, the wide variety of playstyles available, and the limitless possibilities within the world. No Man's Sky was being pitched as a thriving, living universe, where players from around the world could potentially run into each other randomly within the endless expanse of outer space. Even celebrities were excited. Murray had meetings with the likes of Elon Musk, Kanye West, and Steven Spielberg, all of whom were interested in what Hello Games was creating. As the release date grew closer, anticipation was astronomical. Gamers everywhere counted down the days until they could explore the outer space sandbox, and some people even believed it would be the single greatest video game ever made. The hype was so intense that when it was announced that No Man's Sky would be delayed by just six weeks, Murray and his staff received death threats. Yes, there were some people who would do anything to play this game as soon as possible. Two weeks before the release date, a PS4 copy of No Man's Sky was listed for auction on eBay. Nobody knows for sure how exactly it got there, but it was purchased for a whopping $1,300. This fan then proceeded to post a video of himself playing the game for about 20 minutes. While he gave it a favorable review, he pointed out several bugs and crashes that he hoped would be ironed out upon its release. In response, Sony frantically shut down any video footage of the leak, and Sean Murray went to Twitter to encourage fans not to spoil the experience for themselves. While expectations were still high, this event certainly shook the faith of those who were looking forward to playing in No Man's Sky. This was not helped by the fact that most media outlets did not receive review copies. Sony claimed that this was to maintain the mystery of the experience, but it is generally seen as a bad sign when a studio doesn't allow reviewers to be ready upon the release date. And when No Man's Sky finally hit store shelves on August 9th, 2016, players were horrified to discover that some people's fears had been justified. Most people experienced a plethora of bugs and glitches, and many stated that this made the game unplayable. Not only that, but the majority of the features that Murray promised were nowhere to be seen. The game was nothing more than a very simple loop of traveling to a new planet, gathering materials, and then traveling to a different planet. As if that wasn't bad enough, the highly anticipated multiplayer feature was also nowhere to be seen. One of the main selling points for No Man's Sky was the ability to potentially run into other players at any point, but this was quickly proven not to actually be true, despite being listed on the box. To put it simply, the public was lied to. The majority of the blame was placed on Sean Murray. People accused him of lying the entire time, tricking people into giving him money and then releasing a bare-bones product. Sales dropped, review scores plummeted, and Hello Games once again received violent threats. The reputation of No Man's Sky had taken a complete 180 in just a few days. What was once seen as an incredibly ambitious project by an up-and-coming studio was now viewed as nothing more than a scam, orchestrated by a greedy con artist. In most situations like this, the studio would choose to cut their losses and move on to the next game. However, Sean Murray had other ideas. A few months later in November, No Man's Sky received its first major update, titled Foundation. It included a new base building feature as well as the option to play the game in either creative or survival modes. And as time went on, Hello Games continued to add more updates, both ones that were promised in the initial press tour and entirely new ideas, all completely for free. In fact, No Man's Sky continues to be updated even to this day. Many gamers will never completely forget the sense of betrayal they felt towards Hello Games after No Man's Sky's initial launch. But thanks to these updates, Murray and his associates managed to crawl themselves back out of the mud and regain the respect of many in the online gaming space. The Dead or Alive Extreme series has always been fairly controversial. 
The franchise is a spin-off of the Dead or Alive fighting games, and features the entire female cast playing beach volleyball while wearing incredibly revealing swimsuits. With that description, it should come to no surprise that the series has faced accusations of sexism by certain audiences, particularly those in the West. In 2015, during the development of Dead or Alive Extreme 3, it was announced by the developer, Team Ninja, that the game would not be released outside of Asia. When disappointed fans asked why the decision had been made, they released the following comment on their Facebook page. Do you know many issues happening in video game industry with regard to how to treat female in video game industry? We do not want to talk those things here, but certainly we have gone through it in last year or two to come to our decision. Thank you. This post was soon deleted, and Dead or Alive's publisher, Toei Tecmo, stepped in to offer a more official statement on the matter. They claimed that what was written on Facebook was merely the opinion of a single employee, and the limited release was actually due to DOA's limited audience in America. On top of that, they made sure to stress that the game featured an English language option, and Japanese copies would be playable on Western consoles. Nevertheless, the decision not to release the game in the United States caused outrage amongst many fans. As a result, the import site PlayAsia proudly proclaimed on Twitter that they would be selling the game on their storefront. Hashtag DOAX3 will not be coming to the US due to hashtag SJW nonsense. However, we will have the English Asia version available here. This once again caused controversy as people accused PlayAsia of being sexist. But this soon faded, and Dead or Alive Extreme 3 became the import site's best selling game of all time. This would not be the last occasion Japanese developers would censor their products for American consumers. Fatal Frame, Maiden of Black Water, featured alternate swimsuit costumes for the main characters that were exclusive to the Asian version and Devil May Cry 5 covered up scenes of nudity for their US release. Both of these instances caused a similar outcry to DOA, but it seems the American political landscape is not something Japanese developers want to mess with. Starting with the Gamergate movement in 2014, the war between gamers and game journalists has raged on. It's become a stereotype that people who review video games often aren't very good at playing them, and there are a couple of noteworthy examples that are pointed to in order to prove this statement. On May 12th, 2016, the day before the launch of the highly anticipated Doom reboot, Polygon uploaded a video showcasing the first 30 minutes of gameplay. This was an ongoing series for the gaming press website, and was was a standard part of coverage for most big releases. However, this video was different. Viewers quickly took note of how poorly the game was being played. The person holding the controller was frequently missing shots, awkwardly stumbling around the map, missing obvious chances to perform glory kills on enemies, and in general seemed to have a poor grasp on first-person shooter mechanics. Once this video was made public, the internet joined together in mocking it. Polygon already had a poor reputation in the gaming landscape and this was used as further proof that they were an untrustworthy source for gaming news. But many onlookers simply wondered why such a hotly anticipated new game had been given to someone who clearly had little experience with first-person shooters in the first place. For a few days, Polygon was the laughing stock of the video game world, and they did not take it well. Instead of deleting their upload, they chose to disable likes and comments in order to cover up the negative response as best they could. But this would not be the last time a gaming journalist made a fool of themselves for playing a game poorly. In August of 2017, a journalist for VentureBeat by the name of Dean Takahashi traveled to the Gamescom convention in Germany. While there, he was given the opportunity to try out several upcoming releases, including the indie favorite Cuphead. Despite his self-confessed ineptitude at the 2D side-scroller genre, Dean gave it a shot and recorded his gameplay. When the footage was sent back to his fellow VentureBeat staff members, they found it so amusing that they decided to upload it to YouTube. Viewers also found entertainment in how bad this gameplay was. The most notable part of this footage came at the very beginning, as the journalist tried and failed for 90 seconds to overcome the very first simple obstacle in the tutorial. While he was able to finally escape the training sequence after another minute of trial and error, he was unable to make it past even the first level, despite trying for nearly half an hour. Much like the Doom gameplay from Polygon, audiences mocked the critic and wondered how he even got a job in gaming journalism. 
However, the response from VentureBeats was very different than that of Polygon. They kept rating and comments on their video public for all to see, seemingly enjoying the outrage it was causing. Dean, on the other hand, was less amused. He engaged in several back and forths on Twitter with people who were making fun of him, and seemed defensive about the level of scrutiny he was now receiving. Gamers also began digging into his history, and found a review Dean had written for Mass Effect in 2007, in which he criticized the game for its difficulty while seemingly not realizing he was supposed to level up his character. Eventually, Dean published an article apologizing to those who were upset with his footage, and to other gaming journalists who had faced scrutiny due to his lack of skill stating he had misread the climate in which it was received. He once again reiterated that he was aware of how bad he was at the game, and assured readers that a more skilled critic would be writing VentureBeat's official Cuphead review. The Super Mario Bros. series is one of the most popular gaming franchises in the world. In 2017, its latest installment, Super Mario Odyssey, was shaping up to be one of Nintendo's biggest releases yet. One of the new features in this game was the ability to dress up Mario in a variety of different outfits, rather than simply his standard overalls and red hat. While most of these alternate costumes were completely innocuous, one stood out from the crowd and caught people's attention. In Odyssey's Mexico-inspired Desert World, players were able to purchase a sombrero and poncho for Mario to wear. This outfit was featured heavily in the marketing in order to show off the wide variety of new clothes available to the titular plumber. Some people took offense to this choice though, stating that the use of the clothing was cultural appropriation. Posts of this nature were few and far between though, and anyone expressing this sentiment on Twitter was quickly dogpiled by Mexican people, claiming that they had no problem with the depiction of their culture. Nevertheless, Nintendo clearly didn't want to deal with any sort of negative press. While the sombrero remained in the game, the image of the costume was quickly removed from Odyssey's box art prior to release. A common theme in modern gaming is publishers attempting to wring as much money as they possibly can from players, even after they've bought their product. During the mid-2010s, one of the most popular methods of doing so was with loot boxes. Essentially, a loot box is something that players can buy with either in-game or real currency that will randomly drop a small amount of items. As time went on, gamers began to get more and more frustrated with these types of mechanics, but the fact that the majority of items gained from loot boxes were purely cosmetic and meant that they were able to overlook the annoyance to enjoy the game. However, it was only a matter of time before a publisher took things too far. In 2016, Electronic Arts announced that they had begun development on Star Wars Battlefront 2. This was met with skepticism by some fans, as the first game in the series, which was released in 2015, had received mixed responses, particularly due to its use of a season pass system in order to further monetize additional content. But the publisher assured them that the sequel would be moving away from such mechanics, and early gameplay footage looked good enough that it was able to get many games gamers on board, but an air of uneasiness still hung over many people's heads. After all, there was a reason why EA had been voted the worst company in America multiple times in a row. The trouble started when the beta tests were opened up for the online features. Players quickly noticed that the season pass had been swapped out for a new form of monetization, the infamous loot boxes, and their use in Battlefront 2 was different from other games prior. Rather than dropping cosmetic items, these in-game purchases awarded players with improved stats, as well as giving them the ability to play as fan-favorite Star Wars characters. People who bought the game objected heavily to this, stating that this change gave an unfair advantage to those who were willing to spend extra money. A spokesman for EA defended their decision to put stat boosts in loot boxes rather than cosmetic items by saying that they didn't want to devalue the integrity of the Star Wars canon. Darth Vader in white probably doesn't make sense compared to Darth Vader in black. Not to mention, you probably don't want Darth Vader in pink. No offense to pink, but I don't think that's right in the canon. Unsurprisingly, fans were not happy with this explanation. One person even decided to mock EA's statement by modding a pink Darth Vader costume into the game. And as time went on, players began to realize that the microtransaction problem was even worse than they initially thought. While loot boxes were purchased with real-world money, they could also be exchanged for credits earned by simply playing the game. On the surface, this may sound like a positive. 
though people soon calculated the time it would take to gain enough credits to earn just one popular Star Wars character at around 40 hours. To many, it was obvious that EA had done this in an attempt to encourage users to pay money rather than waste all that time. In response to the growing outrage, EA published another statement in the form of a Reddit comment. The intent is to provide players with a sense of pride and accomplishment for unlocking different heroes. Once again, this attempt to calm things down only resulted in more backlash. In fact, this comment soon became the most downvoted post in Reddit history, and the phrase pride and accomplishment was widely used to mock EA and other greedy video game publishers for years to come. That being said, some crafty gamers were able to find a way to cheat the system. What must be understood is that earning credits in Star Wars Battlefront 2 was not linked to a player's skill, but rather how much time they spent in online matches. The only catch is that they must remain active. If they were to stand still for too long, they would be booted from the server and receive no credits. As you can imagine, players were able to cheat the system by simply wrapping a rubber band around their controller causing their character to run around in circles infinitely. This became a somewhat widespread method of earning credits fast, frustrating those who genuinely wanted to play the game. Eventually, the day before the official release, EA finally folded and removed microtransactions from the game entirely. While the studio said that this was due to the fan response and that they would be reincorporating the feature later, many players were dubious of that claim. This was because, just a day prior to this, the Belgian Gambling Commission had launched an investigation into Star Wars Battlefront 2 and all other games that included loot boxes. Eventually, while they did determine that the random loot drops were indeed illegal under Belgian law, EA's decision to remove microtransactions put them in the clear for the time being. After this, several other governments across the world began investigating the video game industry for the same reason. Courts in the Netherlands and the UK ruled that loot boxes should be regulated as gambling. Even lawmakers in the United States were speaking out against the practice. Legislators in Hawaii introduced a bill to have loot boxes banned in their state. This game is a Star Wars themed online casino designed to lure kids into spending money. It's a trap. Some of you folks who are a little older may remember a character by the name of Joe Camel. Uh, he's not around anymore, and um, we didn't allow Joe Camel to encourage your kids to smoke cigarettes, and we shouldn't allow Star Wars to encourage your kids to gamble. While this particular bill was never passed, it only went to show how bad the situation had become. The effects of the Star Wars Battlefront 2 fiasco are still felt today. Over time, EA slowly reintroduced microtransactions to the game, although they can only be used to purchase cosmetic items. In addition, although they are not gone entirely, loot boxes are a far less common sight in modern gaming. On May 23, 2018, EA uploaded the reveal for Battlefield 5, the next installment of their highly popular franchise. This trailer was immediately met with scrutiny, but not for the reason one might expect given the publisher's track record. The point that many fans took issue with was the game's depiction of World War II. What must be understood is that the previous game in the franchise, Battlefield 1, was widely praised for showcasing an accurate and harrowing depiction of the First World War. As such, many viewers were outraged by the colorful, bombastic, and seemingly comedic tone this new trailer was taking. These critics also pointed out several historical inaccuracies, such as characters with prosthetic limbs, and more notably, a woman featured heavily in both the gameplay and on the box art. As can be expected, this backlash was met with a second backlash from people accusing critics of being sexist. Arguments raged over the roles women played during World War II, although these never changed anyone's mind either way. Soon enough, the developers of the game, DICE, would come out and speak in their defense. Battlefield 5's executive producer stated on Twitter that the studio would always put fun over authentic. Alex Kurtz, a design director at DICE, took things a step further in a comment posted on Reddit. I knew this was going to be a fight when I pushed for female soldiers in Battlefield. I have a daughter, and I don't want to ever have to answer her question of 
why can't I make a character that looks like me with because you're a girl? I fundamentally feel to my core that this is the right way, and I will find myself on the right side of history. While these statements were widely praised by defenders of the game, detractors simply accused the developers of talking down to their audience. Even so, Battlefield 5 eventually released with the female character starring on the box art, and was met with largely favorable reviews, but fell below expectations in terms of sales numbers. While EA did cite the game's marketing as one of the factors for this, the failure was more so blamed on the lack of focus on multiplayer. Another reason given for Battlefield 5's underperformance was a greater degree of competition, as World War II had become an increasingly popular setting for first-person shooter games in the late 2010s. In response to this growing trend, the YouTube channel Extra Credits uploaded a video expressing their concerns. There you are, playing the PvP in your World War II shooter, and all of a sudden, you're a Nazi. You didn't ask for this. You didn't choose this. Yet there it is and it's treated no differently than playing a British soldier. This video was heavily mocked by nearly the entire internet, receiving an overwhelmingly negative like-to-dislike ratio. Countless comments and response videos poked fun at extra credits for seemingly implying that all gamers were in danger of becoming Nazis, simply by playing as them in a video game. While they attempted to defend themselves in the pinned comment under their video, they would eventually unlist the upload. For years, Bethesda was one of the most highly respected and beloved companies in the world of gaming, boasting widely popular series like The Elder Scrolls and Fallout. While there were many who criticized their games for being buggy and unpolished, most fans viewed these as charming quirks rather than flaws. The company's director, Todd Howard, has become the face of the studio over the years, as well as one of the most well-known names in the video game landscape. Yes, they had built a very commendable reputation for themselves, but that would all come crashing down with one disastrous game. It all started on May 30th, 2018, when Bethesda revealed their new project, Fallout 76. Fans had been eagerly awaiting the next installment in the franchise for years, and thus were thrilled by this announcement. Unfortunately, that initial hype was soon dampened during E3 of that year when Todd Howard explained that Fallout 76 would be Bethesda's first ever online-only game. What needs to be understood is that, in 2018, a growing trend in gaming was the live service model. Essentially, these were games that were constantly online and intended to be played with multitudes of other players across the world. These services would receive frequent content updates funded by in-game microtransactions, theoretically keeping players engaged for years on end. While these services were still a relatively novel concept, gamers were already beginning to grow tired of them. A petition was started to give a single-player mode to Fallout 76, but Bethesda stuck to their guns and kept the game as it was. That's not to say that there was nobody who was still excited. When it was first revealed, there were multiple versions available for pre-order. A person could simply buy the game on its own for $60, or they could purchase the special Power Armor Edition for $200. This version came with several physical gifts, including a canvas bag. When diehard Fallout fans began receiving their items, though, they noticed something was off. Rather than being made from canvas, the bags they found inside their boxes were nylon. As can be expected, people were unhappy about this, and many wrote emails to Bethesda to complain. However, the response they received from the company's support was far more surprising. We are sorry that you aren't happy with the bag. The bag shown in the media was a prototype and was too expensive to make. We aren't planning on doing anything about it. If people were mad before, this tipped the scales into full-on outrage. Bethesda quickly began scrambling to course correct. The Bethesda Soar support member is a temporary contract employee and not directly employed by Bethesda or Bethesda Game Studios. We apologize to the customer who took the time to reach out. The support response was incorrect and not in accordance with our conduct policy. While this explained the initial curt email from customer support, it did not quell the storm of angry gamers demanding their money back. Of course, Bethesda did not want to give their customers refunds, but they knew they had to offer something. So they went to Twitter and stated that anyone who was unhappy with the bag they received would be given 500 atoms, Fallout 76's in-game currency. While that might sound like a lot, it actually only translated to slightly less than $5 in real-world money. 
When this inevitably resulted in more backlash, Bethesda finally realized it was time to cut their losses and just make the canvas bags. However, this process would present its own problems. They set up a website through which people could submit their information to receive their replacement product. But this webpage was soon revealed to have a massive design flaw. Users realized that they could view the full game, home addresses, and credit card numbers of every other customer who had requested a canvas bag. This site was soon shut down. Eventually, players who purchased the Power Armor Edition did start getting the promised canvas bags nearly a year after launch. Even with all the headaches surrounding merchandise though, most fans would have been willing to forgive Bethesda so long as the game was good. Unfortunately, the game was not good. At launch, players immediately noticed a plethora of bugs and glitches, far more than the standard Bethesda release. In fact, with the sheer volume of issues reported, it seemed as though nothing in the game was working as it should. At best, these bugs served as amusing flubs for people to laugh at, but at worst, they made Fallout 76 completely unplayable. People were frequently being booted from servers for apparently no reason, were inexplicably logged into other players' accounts at random, and in a few instances even had their PCs bricked entirely. While most found these bugs to be a hindrance to their enjoyment of the game, others were able to exploit them to their benefit. A few enterprising players were able to find a way into the dev room, a normally inaccessible area only meant for use by Fallout 76's developers, which contained every single item in the game. These hijackers proceeded to steal valuable loot from the room and sell them to other players. Of course, Bethesda could not allow this to continue and destroy the already tarnished integrity of their product. But no matter what they tried, they could not figure out how the dev room was being accessed. It got so bad that they began banning players for simply having rare items, even if they had earned them legitimately. Eventually, they became so desperate that they sent emails to banned players promising to reinstate their accounts if they simply explained how they were able to get into the dev room. This strategy ultimately proved unsuccessful. As all of this was happening and the word continued to spread about Fallout 76's poor quality, sales dropped dramatically. The price was lowered multiple times in a matter of months, and some retailers simply chose to give it away for free. Even the microtransactions were unable to make up for the low sales figures with the black market of stolen goods from the dev room. While Bethesda continues updating the game with new content, it has not fixed Fallout 76's reputation as one of the worst received video games of all time. The Diablo series has been beloved by PC gamers for many years, and has been hailed as one of the best examples of the action RPG genre. Ever since the release of Diablo 3 in 2012, fans waited eagerly for publisher Activision Blizzard to announce the follow-up and it seemed like their wish would finally come true at BlizzCon 2018, when Wyatt Cheng, a game developer at Blizzard, got up on stage to discuss the future of Diablo. However, this hype quickly turned into confusion when he began explaining what this new game would be. Our modern world is an increasingly connected one. Our mobile devices keep us closer than ever to our friends, family, and loved ones. So we knew we want to use mobile devices as the platform for a new Diablo game. Because nothing brings a family together like slaying demons. As Wyatt continued talking, he explained that this new installment in the franchise, Diablo Immortal, would be a game exclusive to smartphones and would be developed alongside the Chinese studio NetEase. Upon this revelation, the energy in the room full of previously excited fans dissipated quickly. If you want to know more, we'll be back here on the Mythic stage in just a few minutes. It was clear that the Diablo fanbase, made up entirely of avid PC gamers, was not interested in an experience designed for mobile phones. And if that wasn't obvious before, the Q&A section later on in the event only served to hammer the point home further, as angry fans approached the microphone one by one to express their grievances with the developers. Hey, uh, just was wondering, is this uh, an out-of-season April Fool's joke? <laughs> Uh, no, it's it's a it's a fully uh, fully fledged uh, Diablo experience. 
Do you guys not have phones? Yeah, you guys that, all have phones. Phone, right? After BlizzCon was over, these clips from the panel became viral online as people were left baffled at how Blizzard managed to misread their audience to such a catastrophic degree. Even so, they pressed forward with the game, and after several delays, Diablo Immortal was finally released on mobile devices in June of 2022. However, Blizzard wasn't out of the woods yet. Further controversy struck when players started complaining about the game's aggressive monetization. In fact, one player ran the calculations and determined it would take nearly 10 years to fully upgrade a character in Immortal without paying any money. If someone were willing to pay though, it would cost them over $100,000 to reach the max level. While this outraged many, Blizzard did not seem overly concerned with changing the game's mechanics. This was due to the fact that Diablo Immortal was generating over $1 million per day. So despite the rocky release and even rockier announcement, it would appear that the decision to move Diablo to mobile was a decision that ultimately paid off for Blizzard, even if it resulted in a large portion of their fanbase turning on them. Blizzard got into further hot water the very next year during the 2019 Asia-Pacific Grandmaster Tournament. For the game Hearthstone, Blitzchung, one of the top players in the region, chose to compete while wearing a gas mask and goggles similar to what was being worn by protesters in Hong Kong at the time. When his final match was complete, he shouted the phrase, Liberate Hong Kong, during Blizzard's official livestream. In response, the massive video game conglomerate released a statement saying that Blitzchung had been banned from competing in further events for the next year, and they even revoked his $10,000 prize. This decision outraged the masses, as they criticized Blizzard for punishing a Hong Kong native simply for speaking in defense of his home. Others accused the studio of bending the knee to the Chinese government, once again going back to Diablo Immortal as proof that they already had close relations with the nation. These two events happening back to back put a permanent stain on the publisher's reputation, not helped by the fact that several horror stories would soon be released about abuse by higher ups behind the scenes. Pokemon has consistently been the highest grossing media franchise in the entire world for many years. Game Freak has amassed a devoted audience of young and old fans across the globe who will gladly line up to purchase every new game released. These players have proven themselves very loyal to their favorite brand and will defend it from any critics. For example, IGN once published a review for Pokemon Omega Ruby and Alpha Sapphire in which they gave the games a 7.8 out of 10, citing one of the their reasons for docking points being that they contained too much water. This review spread around the internet as a meme. That being said though, as the years went on, the tides would begin to turn. This all started in February of 2019, when Game Freak officially unveiled the newest entries in the series, Sword and Shield, during the annual Pokemon celebration. Expectations were soon tempered though when series producer Mr. Masuda revealed that these new games would feature slightly less content than their predecessors. What must be understood is that with each new generation of Pokemon games, roughly 100 new Pokemon monsters are added for players to capture and battle with. Seeing as Sword and Shield were ushering in the 8th generation, the number of Pokemon in existence had jumped to slightly more than 900. As such, Masuda explained that some Pokemon from previous generations would not be available in Sword and Shield, something that was previously unheard of for the series. This news did not go over well with a large section of the fanbase. There were a few trainers who had a tradition of transferring their favorite old Pokemon into every new game when they were released, and thus were devastated to learn that this would no longer be possible. But Game Freak stood their ground, assuring players that they were only doing this in order to devote more development time towards exciting new features and content, as well as creating entirely new models and animations for the characters that remained in Sword and Shield. As more footage of the games were made public though, the less people accepted the excuses given to them. An increasingly vocal part of the fanbase were accusing Game Freak of simply being lazy and cutting corners in order to meet the holiday 2019 release window. One of the prime reasons for this argument were the graphics, with the trees in particular becoming an often cited example. Many people even said that they looked identical to graphics from games that were nearly 20 years old. In addition, they pointed out the bare bones nature of the attack animations, questioning why Pokemon games that came out on much less sophisticated hardware seemingly had more effort put into them. They also noticed that some animations had apparently been reused from previous games, contradicting Masuda's statement 
statement that all the assets had been recreated from scratch. The final nail in the coffin came a few days before release, when people data mined Sword and Shield to discover that most if not all of the Pokemon character models had been ported from the previous entries on the 3DS. The already angry fanbase quickly spun into full-on outrage at this revelation, and hashtag Game Freak Lied began trending on Twitter. Now, it's worth noting that despite all of the controversy, there were still a large number of people who were looking forward to playing Sword and Shield anyway. These stands started their own trend, hashtag thank you Game Freak, in order to express their gratitude to the multi-billion dollar corporation. Debates between these two factions became heated, and it seemed as though these would go down in history as the most controversial entries in the Pokemon series yet. That being said, the ire felt by many fans did not negatively affect sales towards Sword and Shield in the slightest. Within just a couple weeks after launch, they became the fastest selling Nintendo Switch games in the world, and went on to become the second best selling entries in the franchise. It would seem as though Pokemon will maintain its spot as the world's most profitable item for the foreseeable future, even if it costs them the goodwill of some. On March 31st, 2020, Cooking Mama Cookstar was made available for purchase on the Nintendo Switch eShop. On the surface, this seemed like a standard release in a fairly consistent, casual gaming series. However, things soon became strange when it was removed from the digital storefront mere hours later with no explanation. This was when all hell broke loose, as speculation began running rampant that something sinister was going on under the surface of this seemingly cute and innocent product. You see, it began when people looked through old developer interviews about the game prior to its release, and they noticed something interesting. The publisher working on Cookstar, Planet Digital, stated that the software would utilize blockchain technology in order to quote, add new innovative gameplay that investors can now have equity in. Add that to the reports that the game was causing Switch consoles to overheat, and rumors quickly began circulating that Cooking Mama Cookstar was actually just a ploy to use people's hardware to mine cryptocurrency. First playable, the developers of the game soon spoke out publicly in order to nip these rumors in the bud, by claiming that any talk of blockchain technology by the publisher was purely hypothetical, and was never actually intended to be included. In addition, data miners confirmed the lack of blockchain in the game's code. But that still begged the question, why had Cooking Mama Cookstar been removed from the Switch eShop? Well, as it turns out, the publisher had never actually been allowed to release the game at all. You see, it's important to understand that, while Planet Digital was the company publishing Cookstar, they were simply licensing the IP from the parent company Office Create. Despite the fact that the owners of the Cooking Mama brand never approved the game's release, Planet Digital decided to launch it anyway without permission. This resulted in a long legal battle between the two companies, eventually resulting in Cooking Mama Cookstar being discontinued completely. Interestingly enough, that is not quite the end of the story. During the time when the game was still available, Planet Digital was still selling physical copies on their official website. However, after the lawsuit was said and done, they were forced to remove it from the storefront. If someone were to go on the website now, they will find a new game called Yum Yum Cookstar instead, a repurposing of the original title with new characters they made in-house. While there are still physical copies of Cooking Mama Cookstar in the wild, there was only a limited quantity made before getting pulled from store shelves due to the lawsuit, giving them the potential to become a valuable collector's item in the foreseeable future. When The Last of Us came out in 2013, it was hailed as not just one of the best games of its generation, but also among the greatest of all time. It gave audiences a storytelling experience that no other game prior had ever provided in quite the same way. It elevated the already respected studio who made it, Naughty Dog, to new levels of prestige, and turned the protagonists, Joel and Ellie, into new mascots for the PlayStation brand. As can be expected with this new level of hype, fans eagerly spoke about the potential for a sequel for years afterward. Rumors had been spreading since the very beginning that Naughty Dog was working on a follow-up, but The Last of Us Part 2 wouldn't be formally announced until 2016, as its initial 2019 
2019 release date was met with multiple delays. Fans were growing increasingly impatient to find out more information about Part 2, and some were willing to take drastic measures to get it. In April of 2020, just two months before the game's official release, a few gameplay clips mysteriously appeared online. Sony quickly struck them down whenever they popped up, and are thus difficult to track down now but they still managed to make the rounds regardless. And things only spiraled from there, as more and more videos and plot rumors circulated across websites like Reddit and 4chan. But the biggest update came on April 27th, when a thread was created on the Reset Era forms which spoiled the entire plot for The Last of Us Part 2. Among the details that had been leaked to the public, two stood out from the crowd to the majority of fans. One was the reveal that Joel, the main character of the first game, would be brutally murdered by a new character by the name of Abby during the prologue. The second was that gamers would be forced to play as Abby for basically the entire second half of the story. When the event occurred, it was one of the biggest leaks in the history of gaming, and people everywhere began wondering who could have done it. The initial theory was that it was a disgruntled Naughty Dog employee as reports had been coming out that the studio was making its developers work long hours in order to crunch and get the game out on time. However, Sony disputed that claim, saying that an outside hacker had simply found a weakness in their security. Regardless of how the information was made public though, the revelations about the plot sparked massive outrage from many fans. They lambasted Naughty Dog for killing off Joel, a character they loved, in service of someone new. It was not helped by the fact that rumors were circulating that Abby was actually a transgender woman. This ended up not being true and was merely the result of 4chaners pointing out that she had manly features. While Last of Us 2 did feature a transgender character, it was not Abby. Nonetheless, that didn't stop critics from accusing the studio of filling the game with SJW propaganda. What followed were several months of enraged Last of Us fans sending angry messages towards the developers and cast of the sequel, with some who worked on the game even receiving death threats. An entire subreddit, The Last of Us 2, was created solely for the purpose of mocking the game. Even to this day, a new post can be seen on the forum poking fun at the despised sequel. On June 19th, 2020, the day Last of of Us 2 hit store shelves, its user score on Metacritic plummeted to 3.4 out of 10. That's not to say everyone hated Naughty Dog's sequel though. In fact, many professional reviewers adored the game for its themes regarding revenge and the cycle of violence, and the disparaging scores between critics and users on review aggregate sites are plain to see. This led to several clashes between those who loved Last of Us Part 2 and those who hated it. Many people even accused the critics of being paid by Naughty Dog to give the game a good score. But the sales figures tell a different story. Last of Us 2 quickly became the fastest selling PlayStation 4 exclusive at the time of release, and currently has sold over 10 million copies worldwide. As of now, it's unclear what the future holds in terms of further Last of Us games, but the fact that the recently released HBO television show has said that they'll be adapting Part 2 for their second season means that all this could soon start up all over again. Being based on one of the most popular superheroes in the world, it should be no surprise that Marvel's Spider-Man was a smash hit when it was released in 2018. Fans adored the gameplay and the story's depiction of the main character, Peter Parker, and anxiously awaited the follow-up. In order to whet players' appetites before the full sequel was complete, Studio Insomniac Games decided to release a short spin-off featuring Parker's fellow arachnid-themed superhero, Miles Morales. While the game received some accusations of being SJW filth due to the race of its lead, the vast majority of reactions from critics and audiences were positive. That being said though, a reviewer for the website GameStop had a very strange reason for enjoying it. The way he leaps off of rooftops and flips backwards to face the camera before falling into a headfirst dive is just full of the exaggerated swagger of a black teen. This clip was soon posted on Twitter and quickly gained attention from people gawking at the presenter's odd choice of words. At first, most people assumed that the reviewer, Jordan Ramey, was white due to the sound of his voice, and thus accused him of being racist. This quickly faded when it was revealed that Jordan was black, but it did not stop the masses from continuing to poke fun at him. GameStop was clearly not amused by this new meme though, with one editor for the site responding to the original tweet by saying, 
GameSpot editor here. If you actually bothered to read and listen to Jordan's review, who is black, the majority of it explored Miles' experience of being a black character in NYC. This shameful tweet of yours just reeks of you assuming he was white and speaking out of turn. This response did nothing to calm things down, and only served to spawn further mockery as people accused GameSpot of taking the situation far too seriously. As with most internet trends, this eventually died down. But exaggerated swagger of a black teen is still a popular phrase in the online vernacular. The development studio CD Projekt Red released the teaser trailer for their ambitious new game, Cyberpunk 2077, way back in January of 2013. While it generated some buzz at the time, it wouldn't be until a few years later that people really started to take notice. In 2015, the studio released The Witcher 3 Wild Hunt, which became their first large-scale mainstream hit. This success put more eyes on both CD Projekt Red and Cyberpunk Punk 2077, as their new massive fanbase became eager to play the next big open world experience from the developers. After lying dormant for several more years, Cyberpunk finally received a new trailer which debuted at E3 2018. This gave a much better look at what the world of the game would be like. Combined with the studio's newfound reputation for crafting high quality releases, hype went through the roof. Some wondered why there was such a long gap between the two trailers, but this was minimal compared to the overwhelming excitement felt by most people. Hype hit a fever pitch the very next year at E3 2019. Not only did they confirm an April 2020 release date, but it was also announced that Keanu Reeves would feature as a character. Bringing in famous actors in order to promote games was a bit of a growing trend at the time, and added an extra layer of pedigree to each release. The crowd's love for Reeves was clear during his speech following the trailer, which ended up being derailed by rowdy audience members. An enhanced mercenary working in the sleazy underbelly of the city. Yeah. <laughs> okay, but let me tell you, the feeling of, of being there, of walking the streets of the future, is really going to be breathtaking. You're breathtaking. <laughs> You're breathtaking. You're all breathtaking. All right, all right, all right. So. At the time, this was seen as very wholesome 100, and CD Projekt Red received bountiful Reddit gold for including Lay Reeves in both their game and presentation. But soon enough, they'd be taking an arrow to the knee. As the months passed, it became increasingly clear that not everything was going smoothly behind the scenes at the studio. When the initial April 2020 release date was announced, it came as a surprise to not only the audiences, but to Cyberpunk's developers as well. They had been looking over all the work that still needed to be done and estimated that it would not be complete until 2022. Some people on the staff thought it was a joke at first, while others placed bets on how long it would be until a delay was announced. As it turned out, it wouldn't be long. Cyberpunk 2077 was delayed first to September, then November, then finally December 2022. With each passing month, Redditors became more and more impatient to play the mythical title, even going so far as to send death threats to the developers for making them wait. Yes, as the December release date drew nearer, it was obvious that a certain subsection of fans had taken their excitement too far. In their minds, Cyberpunk 2077 was going to be a masterpiece, and they could not even imagine a reality in which it ended up being less than perfect. But as critics started getting their hands on pre-release copies, they began to publish unflattering portrayals of the product, much to the anger of these fans. One writer by the name of Liana Rupert, who suffered from epilepsy, stated in her review that she had experienced a seizure while playing one of Cyberpunk's flashier sequences, and criticized CD Projekt Red for not including a proper warning about it. This was enough to push some hardcore gamers into a frenzy, and they began sending her videos of flashing lights designed to trigger her seizure. But when the game was finally released to the public, they realized that their fanaticism may have been misplaced. While the PC version of Cyberpunk that most of the early reviewers played was relatively stable, the same could not be said for the console editions. Gamers reported countless intrusive bugs that frequently interrupted their gameplay. 
This would obviously be disastrous for any game, but given both the level of hype surrounding Cyberpunk and the years of development it had been given, players wondered how it could have been released in such an unfinished state. CD Projekt Red soon issued an apology for the condition of their game, and offered full refunds for any dissatisfied console players. While this may seem generous, it proved to be easier said than done for customers to actually get their money back. Since the studio did not have any special agreements with Sony or Microsoft, which would circumvent the already established refund policy for their digital storefronts. However, Sony took it upon themselves to honor any refund requests and even went so far as to delist the game from the PlayStation Digital Store, something completely unheard of for any AAA release. It was eventually put back up for sale in 2021, although it came with a warning for PlayStation 4 owners. As all of this was happening, the studio was suffering massive losses. Their stock price plummeted by over 9% following the early responses, and several investors joined forces in order to file a class action lawsuit against the studio for allegedly misrepresenting their product prior to release. This was eventually settled for $1.85 million. Following all of this, CD Projekt's co-founder and CEO opted to step down from his role at the company. Even after their disastrous launch, CD Projekt Red continued to work on their game and release updates in an attempt to smooth over the many glitches. While a lot of console players still report experiencing bugs, particularly on the last-gen systems, those who have been able to look past the imperfections have largely responded favorably to Cyberpunk. User scores for the game on current-gen consoles are mixed, but lean ever so slightly towards the positive. Despite the fixes, though, it's unlikely CD Projekt Red will ever be able to live down the disgrace caused by Cyberpunk 2077. In June of 2020, Sony released the first trailer for their new game, Horizon Forbidden West, a follow-up to the 2017 Horizon Zero Dawn. While many audiences praised the beautiful landscapes showcased in the gameplay, there were some who took issue with other aspects of its graphics. As one such critic wrote on Twitter, is it me or Sony be making their lead female protagonist look masculine as hell? Barely no curves or rough non-feminine features, unlike the average women. Like, cough cough, The Last of Us 2's Ellie, etc. Just saying, hashtag my two cents. Pick from the game on the left, fan made on the right. Hire fans, lol. The post soon went viral with people mocking the Twitter user for complaining about such a trivial thing, and the crowds had fun creating memes about the edits he made to the face of the game's main character, Aloy. The original poster soon deleted his tweets and the outrage subsided, but it was a brief snippet of a debate that had been raging for years. As some gamers believe, there was a concerted effort behind the scenes of the video game industry to desexualize female characters. Similar controversies have also befallen games like Tomb Raider, the Resident Evil 4 remake, and Street Fighter 6. In fact, this battle was being fought all the way back in 2016. When the game Overwatch was first coming out, players were invited to join a beta test and give their thoughts to the publisher, Blizzard. While most people expressed their opinions on the gameplay and balancing, one form user took particular issue with the victory pose for the character Tracer, which seemed to draw special attention to her rear end. What about this pose has anything to do with the character you're building in? It's not fun, it's not silly, it has nothing to do with being a fast elite killer, it just reduces her to another bland female sex symbol. This post sparked a massive debate, with people arguing back and forth about whether or not the pose should stay. Eventually, Overwatch's director, Jeff Kaplan, stepped in and said they would be removing it from the game. This decision only caused further outrage, with those on the other side of the issue accusing Blizzard of bending the knee to people who would never be satisfied. But the company stood their ground, and the pose remains absent from Overwatch to this very day. Created by fan-favorite video game designer Hideki Kamiya, the Bayonetta series has proven to be one of the biggest cult hits of the modern era. One of the main selling points of the franchise was the titular character, as players flocked to her bold and confident personality. This is why it came to a shock when it was announced in October of 2020 that Bayonetta's voice actress, Helena Taylor, would not be reprising her role in the then-upcoming third installment of the series. At the time, the development studio Platinum Games stated that this was due to, quote, various overlapping circumstances. But this private matter soon went public a few days later, 
when Taylor herself posted a series of videos to Twitter telling her side of what happened. According to her, Platinum had offered her a minuscule amount of money for the game. The final offer to do the whole game as a buyout, a flat rate, was 4,000 US dollars. This is an insult to me. The amount of time that I took to work on my talent and everything that I have given to this game and to the fans. Taylor went on to ask fans to boycott Bayonetta 3 in order to stand in solidarity with her and everyone else who was underpaid for their work in the industry. And stand in solidarity they did, as the masses of Twitter quickly rallied their full support behind Taylor, viewing her as an innocent victim of corporate greed. The outrage soon became targeted at Bayonetta 3's director, who did himself no favors by the way he chose to respond. Sad and deplorable about the attitude of untruth. That's what all I can tell now. By the way, beware of my rules. For context, these rules Kamiya mentioned were his policies regarding interactions on Twitter. Anyone who spammed his replies, asked him questions he had already answered, or annoyed him in any way would be blocked on sight. For years, fans saw this as a lovable quirk of their favorite game designer, and many wore the blocks they got from him as badges of honor. But this time, given the seriousness of the allegations against him and the brashness of his response, the running joke took on a much different tone. Only a few hours after posting his initial tweet, Kamiya's account was temporarily restricted. While nobody knows for certain, many suspected Twitter's system did this automatically upon seeing the sheer volume of people he was blocking in such a short period of time. And to most onlookers, this was seen as a clear admission of guilt. However, not everyone was convinced by Taylor's story. The main aspect that these skeptics pointed to was the person Platinum hired to replace her as the voice of Bayonetta, Jennifer Hale. Hale was a veteran voice actor, and already had a prolific career under her belt. They argued that, if Platinum was willing to pay Taylor's rates, surely Hale would have been too expensive as well. A few days after the controversy started, Bloomberg published an article giving a different version of events. According to them, they had been in contact with two anonymous sources with Platinum Games, both of whom stated that Taylor had actually been offered to perform five recording sessions each paying $4,000 a piece. The voice actress countered, saying that she wanted a six-figure deal plus residuals for Bayonetta 3. Platinum said that they were unwilling to pay this, but still offered to give her a cameo in the game, for which they would pay her rate of one recording session, but she refused again. They claim that this is where the initial report that they offered her a flat rate of $4,000 came from. Taylor refuted this story, calling it an absolute lie. However, a few days later, she posted a thread to Twitter elaborating on some details. She claimed that the actual initial amount she had been offered was 10 grand, with an extra 5 added on once she complained. When she declined to reprise her role, that was when she was given the $4,000 offer to voice a cameo appearance. She also refuted the claim that she had asked for a six-figure deal, but still felt she deserved to get paid better since she believed the Bayonetta franchise is worth nearly half a billion dollars. Nobody knew exactly where she got this metric from, as the series had never been exceptionally profitable in the past. All of this was enough to swing public perception back toward the favor of of Kamiya and Platinum Games, with many onlookers now agreeing that Taylor had fabricated or at least exaggerated her story. The controversy soon faded from memory, and Bayonetta 3 debuted to strong review scores and decent sales compared to the rest of the series. While the IP is still not worth half a billion dollars, it proved fans were still willing to support the cult classic franchise. In March of 2019, the small German studio Daedalic Entertainment revealed that they were working on a game starring the Lord of the Rings character Gollum. This was a radical departure from the previous games based on the beloved fantasy series, as this would be an experience primarily focused on stealth with very little combat. While this made many fans curious, very little information about the project would be made public following the initial announcement. While Gollum was originally slated for a 2021 release, troubles behind the scenes resulted in numerous delays. This started when the launch was pushed to 2022, following an agreement with a new publisher. 
When the release date came and went though, Day Dalek once again was forced to release a statement saying why it had been delayed. This time claiming it was done in order to quote, deliver the best possible experience. While they claimed this would only take a few months, it wouldn't be until nearly a year later on May 25th, 2023 that Lord of the Rings Gollum finally hit store shelves. However, this did not come without its own problems. Only a few days before it was made available to the public, a video showcasing the entirety of the game was leaked to YouTube. The upload managed to remain live for several hours before finally being removed, giving audiences ample opportunity to see how unpolished and dull the experience looked, despite having been delayed by nearly two years to fix these problems. For anyone who was still excited to play Gollum, this certainly dampened their expectations. When players finally got their hands on the game, they were incredibly disappointed to find that all the bugs and unfinished graphics present in the leaked video were still there in the final product. Metacritic scores from both critics and audiences were abysmal, making it the worst rated AAA game of the year. This was not helped by its forms of monetization. If players wanted to hear the elf characters speak in the elvian language from Tolkien's original books, they would have to pay an additional $2.99. If they wanted extra lore information scattered throughout the game world, that would cost another $4.99. And for just one more payment of $2.99, they could purchase an emote pack so Gollum could say his famous line, My Precious. Once it became clear that general audiences were not enjoying the game, the creators decided that they had to release a statement on the matter. They posted a lengthy apology to their Twitter page, thanking players for their feedback and proclaiming their dedication to ironing out the technical issues. However, this did little to counter the backlash. It certainly didn't help that the studio misspelled the name of the franchise in their statement. Despite being in the top 10 most profitable media franchises in the world, Harry Potter has been the subject of a great deal of controversy in recent years. This is due to the fact that the series creator, J.K. Rowling, has frequently spoken out publicly about her opposition to the transgender movement. This has caused her creation to receive a heavy amount of scrutiny, as this magical world once beloved by left-leaning millennials has now become tainted in their eyes. Despite the controversy though, Warner Brothers has continued to monetize the lucrative franchise in any way possible. In 2020, they announced Hogwarts Legacy, an open world video game in which players could explore their beloved magical school as their own original wizard. While the reveal was initially met with excitement by most audiences, the global conditions of that year meant that significant delays were necessary, to the point where a mere mention of her name was enough to cause heated, rage-filled debates online. Now, it's not uncommon for beloved properties to be connected with people that some audience find objectionable, but in the case of J.K. Rowling, since she is still alive and profiting off the franchise, many believe that financially supporting Harry Potter is akin to funding bigotry. And as the February 2023 release date of Hogwarts Legacy grew nearer, that belief strengthened on social media there were mass calls for a boycott of the game, with anyone who was excited to play it being labeled a transphobe. In the lead-up to release, the studio Avalanche Software wanted to make it clear to the public that they were distancing themselves from Rawlings' controversial political views. They announced that not only would gamers be able to play as a transgender person if they wanted to, but they would also be introducing the first trans character to the Harry Potter lore named Serona Ryan. As for the latter edition, critics still complained that her inclusion felt forced, while others said her name sounded too masculine. A web developer by the name of Sam Gibbs created a website called Have They Streamed That Wizard Game? Users could type the names of their favorite Twitch streamers into the search bar in order to find out if they had played the hated software. Anyone who did stream Hogwarts Legacy was bombarded with hate in their chats. Creators who had previously expressed support for LGBT issues got it the worst, as detractors called them hypocrites for supporting a game which owed its creation in part to someone they considered a bigot. Shelby of the YouTube gaming couple Girlfriend Reviews was so overwhelmed with the negative response that she was reduced to tears. Maybe we can do like a bothering me. You can take a break if you want. I'll just stop talking and I'll just go fight into the combat. 
It's important to note that during their stream, Girlfriend Reviews were raising money for the transgender charity The Trevor Project. Other left-leaning creators like Hassan Piker simply refused to play it, saying it wasn't worth it to be bullied over something so petty. Even massive corporate video game publications were affected. Wired gave the game their lowest possible score of 1 out of 10, focusing much of their review on the real world's political elements rather than the actual product. IGN, on the other hand, gave Hogwarts Legacy glowing praise, but clarified in the pinned comment to their video that they supported anyone who chose to boycott. With so much controversy surrounding it, one might expect Hogwarts Legacy sales to be impacted in some way. But instead, the complete opposite happened. The game earned over $850 million in just the first two weeks, making it one of the most successful releases of the past two years. In addition, it soon broke the record for the most concurrent viewers on Twitch, with over 1.3 million people watching streamers play the game simultaneously. It seemed like efforts by protesters to stop influencers from playing Hogwarts Legacy had fallen on deaf ears. It's a topic that won't seem to die, so let me make something very clear. If you buy the Hogwarts Legacy game, you are contributing to transphobia. No matter what your opinion is on any of the controversies listed in today's video, I think the one thing every single person can agree on is that no matter what happens next, there will always be people arguing over video games on the internet.